right now. And uh, and with that said, so allow me to introduce uh, Chef Cassidy here. Uh, I was introduced to Chef Cassidy through Madison Papp, who is another amazing, amazing, talented chef, corporate flight attendant. Uh, she herself has used uh, Chef Cassidy for, um, you know, different various preps on her flights, you know, just helping her get to those stages so that she's able to execute, um, you know, the other steps in flight with, you know, in a time-saving manner. Uh, I also recommended Cassidy to a really, really uh, dear friend of mine uh, recently, and she said her passengers were blown away way by the quality of the catering and how great everything tasted. So needless to say, uh, Chef Cassidy is bringing a much needed expertise and talent to the LA area for all of your private in-flight dining needs. And I'm, I'm so honored that he was willing to participate and do this today. And I just thought it was such a tremendous, um, just a tremendous opportunity. Normally, I only have these calls for the Flightist Mentorship Program community exclusively. Um, but this was one I just felt like, you know what, this community's kind of had a little rough tumbles uh, the past couple of weeks, uh, different various things going on. And I thought, you know, what better way to have everyone come together um, than, than learning some new amazing culinary techniques from, from someone who I deeply admire and think is extraordinarily talented. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor and the microphone over to Chef Cassidy Holman here. Let me just unmute myself real quick. Thank you so much, Jamie. I really appreciate the introduction. Um, yeah, as you were saying, you know, I think uh, just to give a little oversight on how we met, it was through some certain individuals who were uh, who who we both know, and I was helping them with some catering, uh, in-flight catering, as well as private chef catering as well. And, um, you know, this is an industry that I've been wanting to get involved with for quite a while. I've been cooking for quite some time now. Uh, just to give a bit of a background on myself, I'm originally from San Diego, California, born and raised. I went to the San Diego Culinary Institute when I was 18 years old. So it feels like uh, ages ago. I, I just turned 40 this year, so I'm getting up there. But uh you know, I feel like I still have that gusto and I'm, I'm still hungry. So I'm still in the, in, in the, in the game to, to win for sure. And, um, uh, you know, after culinary school, I went to San Francisco to really soak in all of the culinary abundance that was there at the time, uh, quite a while ago, like I said. So, you know, at that time, San Francisco was thriving, very, very prominent scene for, uh, cooking in general, you know, you had people like Thomas Keller and Shea Panisse and Michael Mina, Nancy Silverton. These were all like up and coming names at the time where, you know, there wasn't a lot of the, the newcomers becoming celebrities. It wasn't really that popular uh, in the sense of uh, glamour and glitz. It was more, you know, people knew good food and they knew where to go and you either had the means to do it or you know, it was a lot of farm to table cooking. And, um, you know, I spent a good seven years working there. I probably staged at every restaurant in the city uh, from Chez Panisse to, to French Laundry. All, I worked at the Four Seasons for four years and it was, it was a great experience. It really shined the light on what California has to provide as uh, an abundance to the produce, the, the, the beautiful weather that we have here and just uh, the, the creativity involved in, in the people as well. And so, you know, I spent the seven years there and then I, like any chef, you know, I felt a little, a little con, con, constricted just by the seven by seven miles of San Francisco. So, you know, what's next, you know, I want to go to New York. And so, Upon my departure of San Francisco, <clears throat> I, you know, I thought about what I was going to do. And at that time, I was a young cook. You know, I wasn't really uh, molded into the the place where I, where I felt like I was going to become like an amazing chef. So I wanted to obviously challenge myself. So I researched, you know, every Michelin star restaurant and staged at everyone when I got out there. 
Um, I remember a really pivotal moment in my career was, you know, riding my bike in New York. You know, I had a little fixie. I was like a hipster dude, whatever. And uh, I'm riding my bike in Tribeca and down Dwayne and Reed. And I'm sure people on this call or, or on this webinar are probably familiar with Boulay, which is a very, very institutional restaurant. Um, he's been a founder and just a mentor to many, many great chefs in the world. Uh, rest in peace. He just actually passed away just recently, unfortunately, but that was kind of my first venture into New York and such a amazing experience I had to work with. I got the ch chance and opportunity to work with such amazing caliber of chefs, everyone from uh, Shea Galante to Cesar Ramirez from Brooklyn Fair, three Michelin star restaurant, you know, and it, it built a foundation for technique, hard work, you know, just working like a slave almost, but like you, you want to be there and you want to do the best you can. So that was more or less my first venture. I moved on to um, uh, becoming a part of the Momofuku group before it was ever like this empire that it is now, you know, there was like just a handful of us. And I was with uh, the two Michelin star uh, Momofuku Co, which was previously on first and 10th, very small, I would say 12 seat restaurant. We would do two turns a night, uh, but really dialed in and really focused and very innovative for that time period. I think it really opened the doors for a lot of chefs to realize, you know, it is possible not to have that one track fundamental white tablecloth linen you know you could play music still it could be a fun environment the food is delicious you know it's expertly driven and it, it, it was a it was a good time um i have a lot of fond memories there as well um i also did much more after that uh like i said i spent 13 years in new york so quite a while um, I opened my own restaurant in Little Italy called Gelso and Grand, did that for a year, which was a, a very uh, uh, cool experience, but also, you know, first year of doing anything, you don't really know what you're doing, you're trying to figure it out, and, you know, from there, it led into uh, building more of a foundation as a chef where I feel comfortable in terms of taking a step back now, having more patience and really utilizing everything that I've learned to help my team grow as well as myself. Um, I was also the executive sous chef at Madison Square Garden over the transitioning period when they uh, had the transformation, uh, which was great because it gave me a chance to work with the likes of John George, Andrew Carmelini, a lot of the celebrity chefs who had entered the arena and it also gave me a, a really good foundation for uh, large operational aspects. So I think that's really important in anyone's career to diversify the aspects of what you're doing. Uh, I mean, it might be great to run a small company, but you know, when you're ordering 500 pounds of fish for one little event and then you know, uh, $300,000 worth of produce for another one, it's, it's, a, it's a different animal. And I think that really helped train my main, my, my mindset in terms of not only budgeting and um, scaling, but also realizing the opportunities that are available. You know, as, as we grow our businesses, we want to have more clients. We want to have, you know, better staffing and better help. And we, we all understand the, the, uh, intricacies that come into that and so that really kind of helped me um next i moved on to uh I, I was actually not poached but a hotelier from europe uh from amsterdam hired me to be the executive chef of the hotel pulitzer which is right in the uh the square of amsterdam amazing property five star five diamond they put about 80 million dollars into this renovation so it was a amazing opportunity for me to act as the executive chef and go to another country i'd never really explored uh working in that capacity of like 
across across international waters so that was like such a blessing in disguise opened my my mind up to just all of the possibilities and um yeah i had a, a great tenure there uh un, uh fortunately but unfortunately it was a two-year stint so it was long enough but you know you get your feet wet and then you're like oh man i don't want to leave here <laughs> but home is california and home is uh the united states for me and i love it um I've also worked in Japan. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to be the culinary, uh, um, I, I want to say the culinary director of uh, Wismatic Foods, which is formerly known as Nishimoto, uh, Japanese food distribution company. So we brought um, Japanese food to the American market in a way that could be translated uh, in, in the United States. So all the supermarkets, the Japanese supermarkets that you would see in the United States, a lot of those products from um, everything from Shirakiku to Nishimoto to uh, all the big brands and such an awesome opportunity. I'm half Japanese. So for me, I take it as like uh, kind of my background mixing in with my cooking as well. I, I grew up studying French cooking. So just that transition of, of, cuisines is very, very, uh, I hold it close to me in, in general. Um, and then from that, uh, I, I moved back to California for that job. And unfortunately, uh, as we all know, in 2019, COVID hit, and it was definitely a shocker to all of us, I, I would imagine. I think uh, it affected so many people myself included, my, my term with that company was uh, discontinued. We were a uh, innovation company. So, you know, it wasn't really needed at the time. So I was let go. And that is where I started my company, the Lomas Culinary Concepts. Uh, we've transitioned from Lomas Country Club to Lomas Culinary Concepts to now we're known as Lomas Co. Because we just want to keep it very across the board and not confuse anyone. Uh, just to give a little bit of background on the company and how it got started, you know, during that time, uh, a lot of people were still hungry and still wanting that experience of not only fine dining, but just um, relationship and, and uh, coming together at a table and breaking bread and having a good meal. And it was very, very not not happening. My uh, my wife and I, we had a really beautiful place in the Hollywood Hills, uh, right off of Mahalan, overlooking the Hollywood sign and everything. And we had an outdoor area that was just so conducive to doing something like this. So, you know, I, I took it upon myself and I was like, you know, let me get all the, the, the uh, legal stuff handled. We'll, we'll make it super safe we'll do the testing and everything else and it's only word of word of mouth and uh you know we would do a 10 course tasting menu with a beverage pairing every night for roughly 12 to 16 people and it was such an amazing time you know i think it brought a lot of joy to everyone and you know from there i I uh, wanted it to grow as COVID became less and less of an issue. Um, I was into private chefing as well. I've been very, very fortunate to have some of the best clients in the world, um, the highest caliber from A-list celebrities to presidents to, you know, God knows what. I've cooked for them all and I love it. And, you know, it's just been a passion of mine. Um, with that being said, you know, I really take into consideration uh, the client's viewpoint and what they want and try to execute it to the best of the ability with the, the most gracious hospitality. I think that's what we all are here to do. I think, uh, you know, just maybe off topic a bit, but I have such a, a, a really, really fond respect for what you guys do. It's definitely... Um, one of those things where I never take it for granted. And I'm always, you know, whenever I'm on the, the, the PJs with like the clients and 
the flight attendants, I'm always like, man, you guys are doing so much. You're so busy, but you handle it so well. And there's such a, a grace that you have with it. And I notice it, but I also think that that's why I have such a fond appreciation for this business is because my job is to really help uh, make your job so seamless. So in the sense where, you know, you might have the kids who want the iPad going and the games and then the coffee service and this and that and the third, the last thing, you know, you're thinking about is maybe like plating delicious food. I'm sure like you guys are chefs as well, but you know, if I can deliver that in a way where it really is seamless, where you cut a bag, the puree is ready, this is there. And it's like, oh, I already see this. I can envision this dish in my head. I've I have the menu, boom. It, it just makes life much more easier, I believe. And from my experience of doing a lot of plain food for my clients as well, you know, uh, I didn't realize it until I was up in the air with all of the restrictions that are involved. You know, if you're on a G600, G650, G700, like there's not a lot of space. And the amount of resources that you have there, you know, it might be a microwave, it might be one little oven, you know, you might have two and a half feet of pass space where you can plate up. There's not a lot of mixing bowls. And, you know, th these are all considerations that I feel that any catering company who enters into this sector really needs to understand and have the ability to adjust and adapt. And yeah, so with that being said, I my hat is off to you guys. I think you do an amazing job. And I wanted to take this time to kind of go over some things that have helped me and I think will help you as well as uh, we'll do some plating. I'll show you guys some dishes and then certain things for the summer that, you know, I think the clients might like. I think uh, the one thing I can tell you about my company is that we really try to utilize the techniques and the um experience that I have in these Michelin star restaurants uh, and, and bring that in a transitioning way to make the job uh, much easier for you guys. And so I try to consider every aspect in that in in this whole process and implement those systems into my establishment to help create uh, the best food possible. Uh, we not only source the best quality, but we also really, really believe in uh, just healthy and delicious food at the end of the day. I think one thing that um, people do realize, but you guys probably understand more than anyone, is every client is different. So whether you're a billionaire and you have X, Y, and Z means to do anything, it might not mean that they want caviar and truffles every single day. You know, they might want grilled cheese and tomato soup. And so I've really tried to make a menu that is so expansive that it's very customizable to whatever you would want. And I think that having that ability to be able to uh, customize everything is so important because there's so many restrictions that we always have to deal with where, you know, you, you, you tend not to revert back to the companies that don't want to be um, flexible and have that type of understanding. So with what we do, it really involves not only the hospitality and the care for the guests, but also for you guys as well. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, we've gone over the 15 minutes for the intro. Uh, if you have any questions as, as well, please just throw them in the chat or you can send me an email and I'll gladly uh, reply to you for sure. Uh, but this next 15 minutes, I kind of wanted to go over packaging and just proper storage. I think that's a, a huge thing when it comes to uh, these flights and not only on the flights, but actually preparing for the flights um, with a lot of flights for these clients, uh, your clients in general, I feel like it's a lot of, um, last minute changes too. And I think we're all aware of that where, you know, you might fly out at 6 a.m. and then it gets pushed to 
10 and then it might get pushed to 12. So, you know, I feel like there is some leeway in between those times, uh, but not always. And, you know, getting the food for these flights can be an issue. You know, there's a lot of um, situations where uh, certain people won't deliver in a certain time period, whether it's before 5 a.m. or maybe it's, you know, you need a day in advance, you have a large order, and those things are, are tough. And how do you work around that? I think having a, a structured set of um, a structured list of pantry items that you know your clients like is always a good thing to have. I think, you know, it may be wasteful to have it on every flight, but at the end of the day, you don't want to be caught in a bind. And it'd be much better to always have something, whether that's, you know, a Cambro with some staple items that could roughly suffice for that flight, just in case the delivery doesn't show up. And I'm sure it's happened once or twice to everyone. So that would be my suggestion. Um, I always recommend um, in terms of packaging and storage, uh, uh, vacuum sealing or cryovacing everything if possible. I think that is such a, a game changer when it comes to not only freshness, uh, but storage. Um, I, I will show you guys shortly uh, just the difference in terms of packaging and what it can hold in terms of space wise. Uh, these fridges are not that big. And when you're able to compact so many small uh, vacuum seal uh, containers, it's, it just makes a world of sense. You know, if you have 13 pint containers, it can be roughly, you know, this big. And then if you compact that into a situation you're just you're automatically saving space so i don't know if it's a possibility but there is a lot of catering companies out there uh in los angeles i don't feel like there's i, I feel like there's a lot uh but i i don't think the packaging that they're doing is conducive to the situation so maybe recommending that asking for everything to be vacuum sealed color coded labeled and dated and packaged together. You know, then, you know, you have your kits and you're just ready to open them up and get going. Um, I'm sure you guys have way more tricks than I do on these flights. So I'm just trying to throw out what I, what I, what, what has helped me. Uh, Ziploc bags, if you don't have the opportunity to have a cryovac machine available to you, you know, the Ziplocs are fine. And you get a, a box of 50, you know, maybe wasteful to, go through them, but at the end of the day, it's a time saver and it really allows for cleanliness on these flights. I think that's a huge thing. We all want to be, uh, we, we all want to work professionally and and work at the best of our capacity without putting ourselves in the, in, in the, in the dirt, you know, where you have a thousand things laying around and the client's looking at you like, what's going on, you know? So those, those situations definitely help. Uh, piping bags would be another one. I think they come in handy like crazy. You get a roll of them and you can just run through them and you can pre-do a lot of stuff as well. So for instance, if you have dressings, you know, putting them in pine containers is, it's okay, but it gets annoying opening and closing them, you know, before your flight takes off, you, know, you pour them into squeeze bottles or piping bags, you wrap them up, boom, they're ready to go. Then come time of service, you're just cutting the bag and, and piping. I think that has uh, always been a really helpful thing for me. Um, one thing that I did want to talk about too is like plastic and eco-friendly. You know, there's a lot of flights, there's a lot of individuals who, who either don't want plastic on the flights at all and only want the eco-friendly. So how do you get around that? That can be such a, a tricky situation, you know, but I think um, the bamboo is a good option in certain aspects. They've come up with a lot more options. Um, I have a list which I can put in the link after this uh, webinar, which will kind of help go through those things. If you see something that might 
tick your eye and you're like, oh, wow, I, I like that. Okay. You know, those things come in handy. But yeah, for the ones that can't use the plastic, it's uh, definitely a, a trickier situation for you. But I, my hat goes off to you and how you come and come and do it, <laughs> to be completely honest. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, the packaging is such a huge portion. Um, but I feel like to be absolutely proficient in this situation, it's about organizing. And it really comes down to uh, setting yourself up for success and managing the, the, the meals before the flight happens. I think if it's always a last minute thought, something's gonna get missed or something's not gonna be uh, the best that it can be. So for me, if, when I work with the flight attendants that I work with, I make, I really try to stress it to a point where I'll open the box with them, you know, and, and I'll have a box where it's, it's basically your normal catering box and I'll really open it up, you know, and just go through every item line by line where it really helps them understand, okay, this goes with this, this goes with this, this is color coded. And when I take you guys over to plate some of the dishes, I'm going to give you some examples to show you how I put them together, just so it gives you kind of an understanding of like, wow, it's much easier than rummaging through everything and trying to figure out what goes with what, you know, I think that's always a huge thing. I mean, if you watch the bear, for instance, right now, I'm sure ton of, tons of people are into it and you know, you notice when Carmi gets so frustrated when the tape's not cut right or, you know, the thing's not labeled properly. And, and it really just goes back to just organizing and really trying to get yourself set up for success where it, that thought doesn't come into to, to your head. So my, uh, my, my final suggestion would just be try to think about the flight beforehand and um, the dishes that you're looking to serve and and the plating too, how can we be more innovative? Uh, maybe the client doesn't want innovation. You know, there's a lot of clients that I have who don't want that fussiness. They do not want the extra garnish on the plate, the extra this. And in that sense, it can be easier, but it's also just being mindful and conscientious that, you know, simple food is great too. I, I, I stand by KISS, I think. Keep it simple, stupid is just such a great motto because the moment you start overcomplicating things is the moment that um, you start to get overcomplicated. And uh, I think keeping a calm plate is very easy to intake. You know, we all love good food, but, you know, the eyes eat first too. So we all want to present, you know, five-star dishes to our clients and make, make ourselves happy. But at the end of the day, we have to remember, it's not about us, you know, it's about the client. So how do we make them more happy? And if that's plating something very minimal, then that's what we're going to do. And I think we all know what we signed up for. So that's my suggestion, putting the pride aside and putting the, let the food speak for itself. So that that's kind of where we're at in terms of packaging. I could keep going on for probably a while, <laughs> but uh, I don't want to bore anyone either. So with that being said, uh, I'd like to plate some dishes for you guys and just showcase some things that I think are really cool. Um, I understand that there's not a ton of time when you're plating where it's got to be quick. You got more than one dish. So everything that I do in the kitchen is kind of revolves around efficiency, um, quality, obviously, but by being organized, I feel like certain things, certain dishes are not that complicated to execute and they should be able to be done relatively within 30 seconds, you know, and depending on what your PAX is, you know, how many people you have on this flight, you know, that can be a lot, you know, say you have, six to eight people on a flight if they want individual plating you know that's that's quite a few plates you know you're, you're you've got one course going you're going to the next and blah 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 blah. it can get 
a lot. So the last thing you want to do is, is jam yourself up and have too much stuff going on. So what I've done is really tried to hone in on the main components and let certain things shine as the garnishes. So I put together roughly four dishes. Let's try and get through them all if we can. And um, just to give you like a little uh, understanding of the dishes, sorry. We have a tomato and burrata dish, which I tried to pick dishes that are really nice right now in the summer. So it doesn't matter whether you're in the Hamptons coming back to New from New York to LA or whether you're going to wherever, you're gonna get good tomatoes right now. It's just pretty natural. Um, there's a sweet potato dish with a little bit of yogurt and honey and chives, which I think is amazing. Uh, great for vegetarians, um, a nice protein. You know, people are eating healthier these days and want those options. So I think it's important to have those options available but also deliver them in a way that's innovative, cool, has some technique and very quickly plated. Um, for the appetizer section, I chose like a, a simple egg salad on toast. I think, you know, uh, for me, I love an egg salad. I love like a Japanese uh, egg salad sandwich from 7-Eleven in Japan when I go there, it's amazing. I think we all can't deny it. Unless you don't like eggs, then I don't know if we can be friends, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, the last thing, is I have some purees. I just wanted to plate some purees and show you guys some techniques that might help you in terms of uh, just your everyday drop swish, which I think is just so common and can be overused. And sometimes, like I was saying, minimal is better. So I'll show you guys some techniques with that, as well as uh, some oils, which I think are really cool to showcase and uh, derive a lot of wow factor from the clients. So uh, let me just switch over my Zoom to my camera and I'll head over and set up this station. If you can give me two minutes, I will be right back. Okay, so
Okay. Hey, everybody. I am so sorry about that. Um, when Cassidy accidentally dropped off on his phone, um, it froze my Zoom app where I couldn't even get back on um, to turn my audio to like unmute myself. So I really do apologize. We just had to like kick it back off. I really apologize for that. Um, let me go ahead and find Cassidy in here so I can get him back in as a panelist. Hold on one moment. You know, it's funny. It's uh, it's always the techie, the tech stuff that fails us when we need it most. Hey, Cassidy, are you in? Hey, Cassidy, have you been able to join the meeting again? I am trying right now. One okay. My apologies, everybody. I couldn't even see any Q&A. Like my whole Zoom just froze and I couldn't see it. Okay, there's Cassidy. Okay. Woo, starting back off. Thanks for hanging in there with us, everybody. I apologize. Um, Zoom is still recording, so we're all set there. Cassidy, please proceed forth. I'm really sorry about that technical no glitch problem. there. No problem. I think it was when I'm switching from the computer to my phone, it, it, it logged off. But let me see if I can do this one more time. All right, we're okay. good. <laughs> okay, excellent. You're on your phone. So, Thank you so much, everybody. So just to give you guys kind of an idea, this is what I was trying to explain with the squeeze models. I always keep like quite a few for each client. So if you were to order, you know, you're, you're going to get pipettes, you're going to get little squeeze models, mediums, large. These are the piping bags, which you can order on Amazon. Really, really helpful. You always have quartz and pints. Uh, I'm sure you guys always have gloves as well. Parchment comes really in handy. I think for cleaning situations, I always cut a bunch of pre, uh, pre-cut squares just for whatever I'm doing. And it really helps to, uh, you, uh, it helps to, uh, create less waste and less, less, uh, mess, if you will. These are the cryo bag bags that I tend to put absolutely everything in. So you'll have a small size, you'll have medium, you'll have large. And these really, you know, work with this machine, which is the cryo vac machine. Uh, basically what this machine does is you will put your bag in here with this line and it will vacuum seal the edge, but also take out a lot of the air based on the setting that you prefer. So it really, really maximizes not only space, but you can infuse products, for instance, vegetables or meats with oils, herbs, you know, different types of uh, marinades, et cetera. And such a, a wonderful machine, definitely not cheap, but in my opinion, this is the most useful situation. Um, and then just to give you an idea of a setup, let me see if I can just do this really one more time. Hello? We can hear you. Okay. Can you guys see, you. see anything? There we go. Okay. There we go. I'm so sorry. This camera setup is going to be the death of me. <laughs> now you're doing a great job. Look, it's it's you're you're a chef, right? You're not a, a visual production um, expert here, uh, Cassidy. Approximately, how much are those machines? You know, and I I've, I've definitely worked with that before with with different caterers I've I've worked with previously, um, but I've always been curious so, about that. So they I range. Be... You know, this this yeah. one that I'm showcasing right here can be anywhere from five thousand to ten thousand dollars. Uh, but they have really, really inexpensive ones now that you can buy on Amazon. I believe you can get them at Costco and they do roughly the same job. It's just really a longer process that it takes to suck out the air in certain mm -hmm. aspects and they do take different bags, but overall very much the exact same. And 
uh, handles the process the exact same way. Okay. So just to confirm, Cassidy, there we go. Now we can see something. We can see your chiro chiro-vac okay. bags. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying. I can tell you worked can, at can a. You uh, we, can, we can see it. Yeah, we can tell the the Michelin okay. qualities coming through in terms of the labeling, the color coding, the organization. It's really beautiful to see. I think everyone here wishes we could clone you and put you in every city that we fly into internationally in the <laughs> domestic U.S. because it would be a dream come true to get our catering in this manner. Okay, so I'm trying to see it from upside down. I don't know if you guys can see me. Sorry. But good. this would be this would be kind of like a kit. So this would be the tomato kit, or excuse me, the tomato and burrata kit. And then all of your components would be here. You would have these color coded so that you would know this kit is yellow and these components all go together. Now you might have something that cannot be cryovac or vacuum sealed where it would detrimize the quality of it. For instance, the burrata. Hence, it would not be in one of these bags. So, you know, in certain instances, like not everything is possible, but, you know, you want to compact this as much as possible. So we'll really vac everything that we possibly can that's not going to detrimize the quality. And then the rest, you know, you'll have it in pipe containers or a container that is a vessel conducive to the product. So for instance, the burrata, you know, it would come in water, salted water, and then you would have this, but you could easily take this out too and put it in a, vac uh, a Ziploc bag and, you know, be very gentle with it. But, you know, these pine containers, if you can imagine, I'm just going to pull this away real quick. But just to give you an idea too, all with these, with these packaging, you know, you cut the bag with scissors and then you pour it out. And you would pour it into a squeeze bottle or you pour it into a pine container or you could literally just open the bag and scoop from here and go. The nice thing and one hack, I don't know if you guys can see, but right here on the bottom edge of this of these packages, there's a little slit. So you don't even need scissors. You can pull it and open it from here cool. just to give you a heads up. Um, but just as a point of reference, I put together this kit as well. So this is the same amount of ingredients that are in here, but look at how much space it takes up. So now you're dealing with putting all of this inside of your fridge rather than this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it may look big here from the circumference of this, but it's literally like a mini folder. So you could slide that in and have more or less a hundred of these if you wanted. So Cassidy, um, let's say you have let's say you have four people or four portions ordered of this burrata tomato. Would you do four portions within one Cairo back bag, or would you have like four kits for that matter? Because I always think about the fact of once I've opened something, like perhaps one of those Cairo back bags, for example. Well, mm -hmm. let's say one person wants it, but then three hours later into flight, someone is like, "Can I get that burrata dish that so and so had?" Um, and then right, like you've you've opened it, right? So what what's your preference? Do you like to portion everything together or make separate kits per portion? That is a great question. I think it really depends on your clients and knowing them. But mm -hmm. for instance, this kit right here was meant for four. Okay. So okay, literally... there you go. So that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So I would tend to create the kits based on how many people are in your party. Mm -hmm. And that would be enough for, for one package setting. Mm -hmm. And then we could individually do them as well, if that was what you prefer. But I find that a lot of the times when you're doing, when you're taking the orders from the clients, some people do want it, some people don't. So you end up with roughly like half, if, if not everyone, yeah. but that's why it's really important to have, you know, extra deli containers i always have a stack of these on board and then everything goes into here and then whatever doesn't get used either gets discarded or it can go directly back in the fridge 
Yeah. No, it's just, it's just such a great thing to think through of if someone were to place an order with you of, do they want it individualized? Is it, is it a really long flight mm-hmm. where they would might have to be reusing it hours later? And, you know, I think we always think about, we, we certainly always carry oven tins and microwave tins with us in flight, but I never thought about bringing deli containers, you know, that that's such a great concept, such a great idea for, for other storage accessibility. Yeah. I mean, I, I really believe in having enough for the guests, but also saving it in case they want something later, because we always know that might happen. Totally. So the first dish I wanted to just showcase is the tomato and burrata dish. And this dish, you know, we I, I go to the Santa Monica Farmer's Market every Wednesday and every Saturday. And then there's the Hollywood Farmer's Market. There's quite a few in, in uh, California, so we're really lucky. But um, no matter where you are, like I was saying, I think the tomatoes are really good this year. And in general, during the summer, we're pretty blessed. So it's nice to be able to showcase a dish that is in season. Um, with that being said, the puree, so this is just a puree of spinach and basil and it's very viscous. So, you know, you have the opportunity to keep it inside of either a pine container like this, or, you know, we can transfer it into a squeeze bottle and that can go directly on the plate. But for this application, we're just going to go straight from the deli. And what I like to do with purees is kind of let them speak as the garnish. So for instance, you can definitely do the old school plating of maybe one here, right in the center. And that just lives. You know, and it, and it looks basic but at the end of the day with all the rest of the components it's going to shine to the point where it looks really nice you know there's if you want to be more abstract or maybe you have an artist on board or someone who really appreciates like some some nice uh abstract plating you know i love just going around the plate you know it doesn't have to be delicate precious but it looks very artsy you know and then from there we will finish our components so maybe we add some tomatoes Then we'll take our burrata. So we'll cut it like a Pac-Man, if you will. We'll just season this lightly. A little bit of olive oil, a little black pepper, sea salt. And we'll have some... uh, some nice radish. This is just some watermelon radish that's been pickled lightly. And then this is a little lemon confit, which is basically candied lemon. We'll blanch three times and it'll add some acidity and some sweetness, which is always really nice. And then lastly, we have So here's the bag with the microgreens. These are the dandelion greens that would come with this kit. We're just going to simply open the bag. And I just want to show you just straight from here what it would look like. So we'll pull this. Then you have your greens that are pressed. They're ready to go. And then you can pick through them. You can always rehydrate these in water as well, which just brings them back to life it vibrates them and gives them some some life and you know that would be a simple tomato and burrata dish 
you could easily add uh, some stone fruit to this, some nuts if your client likes it. But, you know, it's very simplistic. But if you can see, you know, the garnish, in my opinion, is kind of the sauce to the dish. So it helps mm -hmm. really act as, as a... Uh, a sauce component and then obviously the dandelion greens don't don't hurt but you know it's very simplistic but it's also uh comforting and you know it's an appetizing little little dish it's beautiful i love that and next up sorry i'm just cleaning really quick I love that you open the burrata. Yeah, I, I just love that. It down. It, yeah. So the creaminess I I, of it, right? Yeah, it really helps the, the creaminess. I do that a lot with eggs too. So if you have a soft poached egg, like maybe a seven and a half, eight minute egg, if you cut it just straight down and then you open it up, it kind of looks like Pac-Man and the yolk will drip out. Then you, maybe you add like a nice dollop of caviar in there. It's always a nice touch. Um, Just makes the food a little sexier. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think the clients appreciate it. We, we appreciate it. Uh, all right, let's move on to the next one. Sorry, Jamie, how are we looking on time? I'm trying, oh, we're I'm trying good. to go. We're, no, we're, you're doing a great job. We're, we're, we're a little... We're a little behind, but we're we're learning a lot. So so proceed. Okay. So the next dish is the egg salad on toast. So this dish is very very homey. It's not so much a fine dining dish, but you could easily make this dish a fine dining dish by adding a dollop of caviar onto each one of these toast points. So what I'll do is. I'll take these toast points and this is really nice because you can pre cut these. Maybe you have a group of five, let's say for instance, like this. Um, this is just a, a technique called quenelling and a quenelle is basically just two spoons and overlapping them to the point where it makes almost like a boat shape. Move it so, a little. Yeah. Perfect. Now we can see. So you'll take your mixture and this will live directly on top. It's funny. I think so many people hear egg salad and they think of like grandma's egg salad where it's like, Oh yeah. You know, just which, not, you know, which is delicious. I don't hate it, but this is a very refined uh, presentation and it's like a, it, it looks like a pretty yolky egg salad, which looks delicious versus like sometimes mm -hmm. you kind of think of like, chunky cafeteria egg salad i don't know mm -hmm. so Absolutely. it's it's exciting to see something that is uh it's kind of universally beloved um reinvented in that way i also noticed you're yeah. doing odd numbers five toast points here yes so i yeah. think it's it's a nice uh homage to grandma's dishes you know but at the end of the day it's comforting to the client as well and this is a great dish to start off your flights with, too. So, for instance, it doesn't always have to be a main course, but this could be a great option for uh, an appetizer situation, you know, or maybe it's not a long flight and they just want a little snack. Like, I think everyone appreciates a little egg salad. So that would be the... And and not only could you do this with egg salad, but you could do this with so much, whether it's um, tuna tartare or maybe it's a beef tartare. You could do a tomato situation that replicated like a bruschetta, if you will. And, um, just for the simplicity, simplicity of it, we're just going to use some of these dandelion greens again just so that we don't waste time. But, you know, it, it's really whatever you make it. And this could be anything from chai blossoms to, you know, micro cilantro or 
arugula, you know, the options are kind of endless here. And like I said, we could fancy this up by putting some Kluga caviar on it, maybe some fresh grated truffle, which is always nice. Uh, matter of fact, I do have some truffle right here. And it would be, you know, this is just a pate of truffles, summer truffles that have been ground up. But, you know, it doesn't take much to make a plate look awesome. And it's really just modernizing it to the point where it makes it a little more appetizing. And then, you know, you could take this, you could dip it in and have a bite and it's whew, amazing, delicious. I love that. Love that. Yeah, it totally elevated it. Yeah, it gives it a little more pizzazz. But simple and easy to execute. Very simple. Nothing that we're doing here is difficult. And I think as we noticed, like it can be plated fairly quickly, which is nice. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing I wanted to do was just showcase some oil. I think oils are awesome and really easy to make. Uh, we provide a lot of different oils. Uh, my company, what we love to do is specialize in garnish kits. So for instance, we'll do uh, an array of different garnishes. And when I say garnishes, I mean not only herbs, uh, microgreens, uh, petite lettuces, shiso blossoms from Japan. There's a, a whole array, whatever we can get that's amazing in season, but also we'll provide purees. So anything that's going to go delicious with whatever dish that you have, you know, we really think that elevates the dish to another level. So whether that's a spinach puree or a beet puree or a chive oil, a basil oil, cilantro oil, these things will all be in either small piping, uh, small pipettes or little squeeze bottles just to help you elevate the dish. So either way, you're going to get something with everything. And if that is something that interests you, you can order it separately as well. Uh, yeah. one of the For things me, pure, purees are like the hardest thing to execute fresh on board because it, one, it requires a blender. So that's galley amperage, but two, you normally you're using your cooktop induction cooktop. So you're taking time away from induction cooktop to execute the blender. And then to make the puree really nice, you do have to run it through a, a sieve, right? And uh, so, so to me, I love that you're already thinking ahead of like, how can we make this look really stellar? Because that is the purees are the one of the biggest things that elevates a dish from just mediocre to like, wow, this has some real artistry to it. So, you know, I, I, I just love, love, love your philosophy of like, how can we, um, how can we make sure that, that we're setting, that we're setting everyone up for success with, with these purees and, and even in the way they're packaged, it's, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think if there's anything that I would want in terms of uh, help with on a flight, you know, the main components are going to be pretty easy to reheat and portion or execute in general. But these tedious ones, the purees, the oils, you know, it takes a while, like you're saying. And if that can all be pre-done and ready to go, oh, it's such a such a game changer, right? Absolutely. Love it. Let's see it. Let's let, let's okay. do your do your thing. <laughs> so so this dish, you know, would be a very th this is a tomato water mixed with chive oil and basil oil and then whatever components that you want. So I specifically just got some really nice heirloom tomatoes. And for this simple case, I, I wanted to just showcase the the oil aspect with the water. So we basically take uh, tomatoes, pulse them in the in the RoboCoop or a blender of your choice, and then we'll strain this through a cheesecloth overnight. And what you get is really, really refreshing tomato water. And this just, you would pour table side for them and it almost acts as like a soup, if you will, or a little consomme. And when it's ice cold, oh, it's absolutely delicious. But the cool thing about this is like right now, it just looks like a pool of uh, tomato water, if you will, right? But the moment that we introduce a little bit of 
chive oil to this or basil oil, watch what happens. Ooh, it's so fun. You know, it just, it really helps not only with the flavor, but as it separates from the emulsification, it, it looks gorgeous, right? And mm -hmm. it's nothing crazy. It's nothing insane. It's just utilizing the, uh, the the oil with the uh right the natural with, chemistry with, that with oil, oil and water don't mix <laughs> like yeah, you don't yeah. like taking advantage of that that's totally. so beautiful really really so, really beautiful another interesting uh not necessarily a hack but sometimes you know you'll cut a piece of meat whether that's a piece of beef or a piece of lamb um after it's been reheated and it, you know the blood will uh, resurge onto the plate, right? It's never a nice thing to see. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, it's been cooked pretty well, but it wasn't rested. So the one thing that will really help is when you have this, these oils with you, if you drizzle this oil into that blood, it almost looks exactly like this. So it's an easy way to um, trick the mind of it being the actual blood, but now it looks like a sauce that incorporates into the beef. So purposeful. I always say, yeah, very purposeful. Great, great uh, terminology for sure. Yeah, so I, these, I think that's a brilliant idea because I've been there where I'm like, oh my word, this just looks messy now. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> we're always looking for those opportunities to, how do I fix this? You know, oh, yeah. I got to pick up all the beef and then replate it and but in uh, that, wipe in the plate situation. with, you know, some type of acidic water mixture. Cause otherwise if you just wipe it, it leaves the smear, right? Cause this it has true. fat to it. So I yeah, love that. Yeah. I'm totally taking that and putting that in my toolkit. <laughs> Excellent. Well, this is all that I think we have time for. Um, yeah. In terms of the puree aspect, uh, you know, I think like we were saying, these Here's the 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 one example I was giving with this sauce where, you know, it looks very artsy, but like I was saying, you could take an offset spatula. You uh, Let me just grab one real quick. You know, I think there's so many ways that we could plate this, but if you put that down just like that, and then you know, it looks interesting, but now all of the components can live here. You have a little streak, and you know, with every bite, they're going to pick something up. I think there's endless ways of repurposing purees. And I would say just be creative. You know, at the end of the day, you can plate something a thousand times and it's never going to look the same. Uh, yeah. And however much you try, like that's how much you're going to get better at it. So it's all about practice. It's all about experience. It's all about being in a situation of confidence and feeling, uh, uh, moving with purpose and yeah. feeling of intention. So that would be my, 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 Point of advice. I love it. And, you know, one thing you, you kind of already talked about just ever so slightly when you mentioned, you know, you would pour the tomato water table side, right? In the same capacity of that table side presentation and communication. Um, one thing I really loved that you said that I just want to point out for everyone attending too, is he had the truffle um, puree, pate, puree, pate. I'm not certain what, what terminology you use, pure, pure, truffle puree. And sure. he said, you know, you could dip it. Well, I always say, uh, you know, have you ever been at a restaurant where they drop something off and they kind of tell you how to eat it, right? They're like, we recommend doing this and that. Well, I think that's one of the dishes, that beautiful egg salad, you would have to kind of have a just small educational period where you're like, we recommend picking up your toast point and dipping it in the puree. Cause otherwise some people just eat it straightforward and not 
you know, incorporate those, those different components to the dish. So not being afraid to, uh, one kind of what, uh, Cassidy was saying and feeling empowered in your creativity and intentionality, but feeling empowered to also like, you're the conductor of the show. You're the conductor. You're the one plating it, making those, those masterpieces in, in flight, you know, don't be afraid to also educate as you go with, with your clients, um, in that way, like, you know, and you know, tell them how to eat the food, how how to enjoy it best, I should say. Cassidy, it looks like your other camera came on. Okay, excellent. I um so uh Sorry, let's leave can a couple you, uh... minutes, a little couple minutes for QA here. I have to be honest, everybody. My um my Zoom interface, and this is just the tech, uh tech not failing me here everyone can hear everyone can see but okay, i can't great. i can't see any q a here so cassidy you will maybe if anyone has a question for cassidy um you know please, please feel free to put that in q a i just can't see it or facilitate it so i'm uh, sorry my friend you're on your own here <laughs> um i have the chat open but i think because we were because i was going from phone to computer and on and off i think it's uh deleted the chat so unfortunately, guys, I can't see anything in terms of questions, but if you have any questions, I'm going to leave my email with uh, Jamie. I, I think she put it up already. Yep. I put up the um, website on, and then I chat. also shared your in-flight dining menu. And I also just got a message from a dear friend who said nothing on Q&A. So it looks like we're in the clear and Cassidy, like okay. we stayed relatively on time. Like we're only eight minutes over here. So I think we're... Yeah. I think we did well. Um, All right. But it well, guys, I really want to thank everyone. And Jamie, thank you so much. Uh, this was an awesome experience. I hope, if anything, something came of it. Uh, you know, I, I don't think of myself as a teacher at all. I'm, I'm more of a, a better instructor in the kitchen. But this was really fun. And like I said, I really appreciate everything that you guys do. Uh, I think you're awesome. And I would love to work with every one of you. So you know, if you're in LA, it'd be my pleasure to uh, service you guys and work with you. So yeah. thank you again. Um, it's been a pleasure. Julie, thank you so much, Cassidy. And again, if anyone, someone just said the chat's disabled, chat is different than Q&A. There's a Q&A uh, function uh, on here too with a little question mark. Uh, so oh. um, I did, the chat box wasn't open. Um, so I apologize, guys. We're kind of already running over a little bit anyhow. So I've I've shared uh, Cassidy's website um, and then his in-flight dining menu in the chat function as well. So you can click that. If you have any questions, feel free to um, DM. It's not letting me click the Q&A, unfortunately. So I can't see anything. Um, anyhow, I... Uh, I hope you guys learned something new today, felt excited about what, you know, what you can do on board and, and what's possible. Um, and if you are in LA flying out of LA, um, are there any airports you don't uh, go, you don't service in the LA area, you know, between Burbank, Long Beach, you know, are you mostly Van Nuys? Uh, we are located in Van Nuys. So that is our primary destination, although every airport. So we are at Long Beach, LAX, FBOs. Um, um, yeah, mainly every airport. Cool. Well, Unless Cassidy, I have a feeling you're going to be pretty busy after this call. So um, like I, 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 if you have any questions, you know, again, this, this community goes both ways. You have served us today. You have helped us learn some new things. So if you ever have a question about uh, anything when it comes to in-flight dining and providing it, please allow us to extend the same favor that you've given us today and in, in sharing your amazing experience. It was, it was, um, such a, such a cool opportunity to, to get behind you in your kitchen and see the way you think about things and think through it. So, so thank you so much again for the opportunity. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thank you guys. Right. Everyone have a wonderful day. I hope everyone is well. Take care. Take care.